Chapter Six of Jetta of the Lowlands by Ray Cummings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ether wave eavesdropping. I had thought it was a cavern mouth into which the men had disappeared, but it was not. I reached it without any encounter. It loomed above me a great archway in the cliff, an opening fifty feet high and equally as broad, and behind it was a roofless cave, a sort of irregularly circular bowl, five hundred feet across its broken, boulder-strewn, caked ooze floor. I crouched in the blackness under the archway. The moon had risen, and its light filtered with occasional shafts through the swift-flying black clouds overhead. The scene was brighter. It was dark in the archway, but a glow of moonlight in the bowl beyond showed me its tumbled floor and the precipitous, eroded walls, like a crater rim, which encircled it. The men whom Perona had met were across the bowl near its opposite side. I could see the group of them, five hundred feet from me, by a little moonlight that was on them, also by the sheen from the spots of their handlights. Four or five men in Perona. I thought I distinguished the aged minister sitting on a rock, and before him a huge giant man's figure striding up and down. Perona seemed talking vehemently. The men were listening. The giant paused occasionally in his pacing to fling a question. All this I saw with my first swift glance. My attention was drawn from the men to an object near them, the nose of a flyer, showed between two upstanding crags on the floor of the valley. Only its forward horizontal propellers and the tip of its cabin and landing gear were visible, but I could guess that it was a fair-sized ship. The men were too far away for me to hear them. Could I get across the floor of the bowl without discovery? It did not seem so. The accursed moonlight became stronger every moment. Then I saw a guard a dark figure of a man showing just inside the archway, some seventy feet from me. He was leaning against a rock facing my way. In his hands was a thick-barreled electronic projector. I could not advance. That was obvious. The moonlight lay in a clear, clean patch beyond the archway. The guard stood at its edge. A minute or two had passed. Perona was still talking vehemently. I was losing it. Not a word was audible. Yet I felt that if I could hear Perona now, much that Hanley and I wanted to learn would be made clear to us. My little microphone receiver could be adjusted for audible air vibrations. I crouched and held it cautiously above my head, with its face like a listening ear, turned toward the distant men. My single vacuum amplification brought up the sound until their voices sounded like whispers murmured in my ear grids. De Beer, listen to me. Perona's voice. They must have been chance words spoken loudly. It was all I could hear, save tantalizing, unintelligible murmurs. So this was De Beer, the bandit, the big fellow pacing before Perona. I wanted infinitely more now, to hear what was being said. I thought of Hanley. There might be a way of handling this. I had to murmur very softly. I was hidden in these shadows from the guard's sight, but he was close enough to hear my normal voice. I chanced it. A wind was sucking through the archway with an audible whine. The guard might not hear me. X, two, A, Y. The sorter's desk. He came in. I murmured, Handley's rating. Rush, danger, special. It went swiftly through. Handley, thank heaven, was at his desk. I plugged in my little image finder, held it over my head, turned it slowly. I whispered. Look around, chief. See where I am? Near Narita, a couple of miles out. Followed Perona. He met these men. The big one is De Beer, the depth bandit. I can't hear what they're saying, 
but I can send you their voice murmurs. Amplify them all you can. Relay them up, Hanley ordered. I caught Perona's murmurs again. I swung them through my tiny transformers and off my transmitter points into the ether. Hear them, Chief? Yes, I'll try further amplification. It was what I had intended. Hanley's greater power might be able to amplify those murmurs into audible strength. I'm getting them, Phil. He swung them back to me, grotesquely distorted, blurred, with tube hum and interference crackle. They roared in my ear grid so loudly that I saw the nearby guard turn his head as though startled, listening. But evidently he concluded it was nothing. I cut down the volume. Hanley switched in. By God, Phil, this... Off, Chief. Let me hear, too. He cut away. Those distorted voices. They came from Perona and the bandits to me across this five-hundred-foot moonlit bowl, from me thirteen hundred miles up to Hanley's instruments and back to me once more. But the words, most of them, now were distinguishable. Perona's voice. I tell it to you, De Beer, and a good chance for you to make the money. But will they pay? Of course they will pay. Big, a ransom, princely. And why, Perona, why princely? Who is this fellow, so important? He is with rich businessmen, I tell you. A private citizen? And a private citizen of a surety. Fool, have you come to be a coward, De Beer? Pa, well then, I tell you, it is a lifetime chance. All of it I have arranged. If he was a government agent, that would be very different, for they are very keen, this administration of the American government, to protect their agents. But their private citizens, it is a scandal. Do you not ever pick the newscaster's reports, De Beer? Has it not been a scandal that this administration does very little for its citizens abroad. And you want to get rid of this fellow? Why, Perona? That is not your concern. The ransom is to be all yours. Make away with him in the depths somewhere. Demand your ransom. Fifty thousand gold standards. Demand it of me, of Narita. And you will pay it? I promise it. Narita will pay it, and Narita will collect the ransom from the American capitalists. Very easy. His voice fell lower. Between us, you will get the ransom money from the Rita, and then kill your prisoner if you like. Call it an accident. What matter? And dead men are silent men. De Beer, I will see that no real pursuit is made after you. They were talking about me. It was obvious. Questions rushed at me. Perona, planning with this bandit to abduct me, hold me for ransom, or kill me. But Perona knew I was not a private citizen. He was lying to De Beer to persuade him. Why this attack upon me? Was Spawn in on it? Why were they so anxious to get rid of me? Because of Jetta? Or because I was dangerous, prying into their smuggling activities, or both? De Beer, Get up with my men through the streets to Spawn's house. You have it fixed. Yes, over the route from here, as I told you. There are no police tonight. I have ordered them off. In the garden, Dios, you offer so many objections. I tell you, all is fixed. In an hour, half an hour, even now, perhaps, the Americano is in the garden. The girl has promised to meet him there. He will be there, fear not. Will you go? Yes. Ha, ah, that is the De Beer I have always admired. I could see them in the moonlight across the pit. Perona, now standing up, the giant figure of the bandit towering over him. Hanley's microscopic voice cut in. Getting it, Phil? To seize you for ransom. Yes, I hear it. The girl who? Wait, chief. Off. De Beer? I will do it. Fifty thousand. Perona. An hour now. Spawn will be at his home asleep. And you will go to the mine? 
Yes, now, from here. You seize this fellow, Grant, and then attack the mine. Our regular plan, De Beer. This does not change it. Attack Spawn's mine? Half a million of treasure was there tonight. Perona was chuckling. You give Spawn's guards the signal. They are all my men, in my pay. They will run away when you appear. Hanley cut in again. By the gods, they're after that treasure. Phil, listen to me, you must. His voice faded. Chief, I can't hear you. Hanley came again. And I will notify Puerto Rico. The local patrol will be about ready to leave. Or notify Narita headquarters, I suggested. If you can get President Marks, he can send some police to the mine. And find all Narita's police bribed by Perona? I'll get Puerto Rico. We have an hour or two. The patrol can reach you in an hour. The bandits were preparing to leave here. Two or three of them had gone to the flyer. Perona and De Beer were parting. Well, that is all, De Beer. Right, Senor Perona. I will start shortly. On foot, by the street route to Spawn's. Hanley's hurried voice came back. I've sent the call to Puerto Rico. The guard had moved again. He was no more than forty feet away from me now, standing up, gazing directly toward where I was crouching over my tiny instrument in the shadows of the rocky arch. A footstep sounded behind me on the path outside the arch. Someone was approaching. A tiny light bobbing. Then a voice calling, Perona, De Beer. The guard took a step forward, stopped with leveled weapon. Then the voice again, it was so loud, it went through my open relay, flashed up to New York, and blew out half a dozen of Hanley's attuned vacuums. Perona. Spawn's voice. He was coming toward me. I lay prone. My little grids switched off. I held my breath. Spawn's figure went past within ten feet of me, but he did not see me. He met the guard. Hello, Gutierrez, that damned American. Perona and De Beer came hastening. Spawn joined them in the moonlight, just beyond the archway, close enough for me to hear them plainly. Spawn was out of breath, panting from his swift walk. He greeted them with a roar. The American, he is gone. Dios, gone? Where, Spawn? The hell. How do I know, Perona? He has gone from his room, from the house. Maybe he followed you here, did he? End of chapter 6